Come on in, 10 o'clock, folks in the foyer, we're going to get our seats. Hey, Travis in the back. Travis Carey. Take one, pass it down. Thanks. Hey, Tom. Um, I'm going to just hand it on this side then. Okay. James, just have everyone come inside now. We're going to get started. Doors are closing, all four of them. Come on in, find a seat. We've got handouts today, so they're going around the room. If you don't get one in the next five minutes, raise your hand and, and we'll get one to you. All right, well, uh, this is our second week here of our evangelism training series. Last week, we talked a little bit about uh, the theology and the philosophy of evangelism. We'll do a little bit of review if you weren't there last week. But homework from last week, how many of you were able to identify at least two non-Christian contacts? Friends, family, people you know. I want to see hands so that I can come talk to you about it afterwards and be encouraged. <laughs> I see a few hands, so I'll come find you. Great. Um, so we'll do a quick review. Right? What is evangelism? We gave this definition of evangelism is communicating to specific people, that is, non-Christians, a specific message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, with a specific purpose, conversion we talked about is our, is our purpose, in the power of God. And what we mean by that is, is God is the one who does the saving work. Why do we evangelize? We gave three reasons. There are more. There are many sub-reasons, right? But we talked about how our love for God's glory and our love for the gospel motivates us to evangelize. We talked about uh, our love for people, for those around us who have not yet made Christ their Lord. Love for them to come into the kingdom. And thirdly, a desire to obey God's commands. We're commanded to do evangelism. 
And by the way, feel free to interrupt with any questions. Just shout out or, or raise your hand. And then we talked a little bit about how do we evangelize, right? First thing is we want to be faithful to the gospel message. We talked about not wanting to tamper with God's word or to distort the gospel. Any system or any curriculum or set of tactics that does this, we would consider uh, not faithful. Not, that's not doing evangelism if you're tampering with God's word. There's an element of individual evangelism, right, one-on-one -on -one or one-on small groups, as well as a corporate witness that the church has when we gather together as Christ's body. And so we're called to do it individually. We're called to contribute to a culture of evangelism within the church. And then we talked about getting trained, right? The first part of that is learning some kind of outline or some kind of curriculum. We're going to be doing that here in the next couple of weeks is going through one particular curriculum. Um, and then also the aspect of getting on the job training. It's not enough to just be filled with knowledge, but we actually got to go, go do it. And in so doing evangelism, we make it our own. We learn the concepts uh, and internalize them for ourselves. We can uh, adapt the content to ourselves and to the individuals that we're talking to. Uh, and so on your handout, there is the same class outline that you saw at the end of last week Right, the six weeks there, and actually I need to get a handout. I always forget to get my own copy. Um, we've got the six weeks. Today's week one, we're going to be talking about Jesus' divinity and authority. And I mentioned last week, this is based on a book that's published called Christianity Explained. Uh, we've made some changes, but, but overall it's, it's, it's mostly the same kind of structure. Uh, each class does build on the previous one. And so we encourage you to, to be here for all six weeks. And there will be homework, uh, mostly reading the Bible. So uh, if you don't have a Bible, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, Bibles these days are, are so cheap um, from a cost perspective. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, normally this is being done on a one-on-one -on -one or with a small group. Now there are, what, I don't know, 80, 100 people here in this room. So it's going to look a little bit different. Um, but, but generally speaking, same content. As part of past classes that we've run with this curriculum, I promised people that they are not going to be asked to pray out loud, read out loud, or answer questions out loud. Um, but questions from you all are, are welcome. Feel free to raise your hand and just kind of shout it out. Uh, and we mentioned last time, I don't know all the answers. None of us do. But as Christians, we believe that the Bible is sufficient uh, and that we can find the answer together. Okay, so handouts, this one-page handout. Who does not have a copy of this? Raise a hand. Web. Someone get Web a copy of the handouts. Thanks, Dan. All right. So introduction this week, Jesus, Divinity, and Authority. Um, we're blessed to have this facility where we've got HVAC and comfortable seats and also pencils in front of your seats. And so you'll, you, might, you might need some of those. But the first question we want to put to you all, and again, we're not asking you to answer this out loud. This will be something for you to think about and, and write down your answer in the space provided. What comes to mind when you think of Christianity? By the way, if you consider yourself a Christian, we still want you to participate. Take 30 seconds now to, to write it down, and we'll give you that time. What do you think of when you hear the word Christianity? Go ahead and look up when you're done writing down your answer. So we're going to learn in this, in this next couple of weeks, Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. And uh, I mean, it's, it's literally in the name, right? Christianity. Uh, it's not primarily about we're going to find a, a set of rules or being a good person 
or doing religious activities, coming to church, praying, reading your Bible. Uh, we'll talk about all those things, but Christianity primarily is about a person, uh, that person being Jesus Christ. And so the goal for our class here, written on your handout, is to learn the real meaning of Christianity by looking into the life, teachings, and claims of this person, Jesus Christ. Now, how do we do that? The primary means by which we learn about Jesus Christ is through the Bible. And um, hopefully you have copies of the Bible here. Um, Bible has all kinds of genres of literature, but what we're going to be spending our, most of our time on is a particular book in the Bible, the Gospel of Mark, which is what we call a historical narrative. It's a historical record of uh, Jesus' life, what, what he did, what he taught, uh, accounts of people who were with him. Now, in the Bible, there are four separate accounts of Jesus' life. We call those the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And uh, it's actually a good thing, right, that we have four separate accounts. We get that full, multifaceted picture of Jesus' time while on this earth. And so let's now open your Bibles to find uh, the Gospel of Mark. If you don't know where that is, most Bibles these days have a little table of contents in the front where they list the 66 books of the Bible and page numbers. So we're going to go to find Mark and turn there. Page 1164 in my Bible. We're going to be spending most of our time today in Mark, and so it is definitely worth it to actually open up there. And uh, this following slide here, probably review for most of you, but this is something I share with people that I, that I meet if they have no kind of Bible or church background. How do we read Bible passage references, right? If I say something like Mark 1, what that means is we're looking in the book of Mark, chapter 1. There's, books are broken up into chapters. I could be referencing multiple chapters, Mark 1 through 5. That's referring to the first five chapters of Mark. Mark 1, colon 1, the colon separates the chapter number and the verse number. So verses make up chapters, which make up books. You can have multiple verses, right? Mark 1, that's chapter 1, verse, verses 21 to 28. And then you can have this ridiculously complicated passage reference, where it's Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, and if for some reason the preacher wants you to skip those verses and jump to 35 through 43. So hopefully most of you are familiar with this. Uh, but it turns out this is not, you cannot assume that this is common knowledge uh, in our society, in our culture these days. Uh, and that's fine. We want to make sure that people can be brought along uh, to see what the scripture says for themselves. What a blessing we have to be able to do that, right? We don't rely on, we're going to see in a bit, scribes or uh, religious leaders to uh, read the Bible to us. We have copies of it in front of us, which is, which is great. All right, so let's look now at the first verse, first chapter. This is all in your handout, by the way, so you can follow along in your handout. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. We'll just read this one verse. Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We'll stop there. First verse here that we're looking at, what is Mark doing here? Mark, the human author, he's ascribing deity to Jesus, right? He calls Jesus the Son of God. What does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus uh, is the Son of God? It means he has all the authority of God. That's going to be our theme for today, Jesus' authority. Jesus is a person with authority. And uh, what is authority? Think about the, the secular concept of authority, right? There's, there's two necessary pieces in my mind for authority. One is the right to command others. So I don't do this full time. I don't study the Bible full time, but uh, I, I work at a software company. I'm an employee at a, at a software company. My boss has the right to issue me commands. He has authority over me. He says, write this report and get it submitted by the end of the day. He has the right to ask me to do that. 
And uh, you think about a military hierarchy, right? And in our country, there's a hierarchy of authority. Commissioned officers in our military have authority over warrant officers who have authority over the enlisted personnel, right? They, they have the right to issue commands and the expectation that those under the authority would submit authority. So that's the right to command others. But also, I mean, is, is that enough for true authority? You also need a second piece, which is the power or the ability to make those things happen, right? to enforce the command or, or to make certain things happen. Right? So what is, the, what, is, what is my boss's authority uh, or his power to make things happen that, that gives him this, this true authority? What, what, what power does my boss have? To fire me, that's right. Fire me or to reprimand me, uh, other undesirable consequences. Um, so you think about a prince, right, who is, maybe, maybe this prince has the right to command others. But this prince does not have the army or the military force to back him up. Does this prince have true authority in, in, in the most true sense? We would say no. He may, have, he may be the rightful heir to the throne, but with, with no army, no support from the people, uh, this prince does not have the power to make things happen. So there's authority, the right to command others, and the power to make things happen. And it turns out Jesus has both. We're going to see examples of that. He has both the right and the power. Now, same chapter now. Let's keep going. Flip over your handout here uh, to the other side. We're going to be in Mark 1, verse 21. Let's go ahead and read Mark 1, 21 to 28. And they went into Capernaum. All right, I'm, I'm going to pause there. Capernaum. Now, we said the Bible is filled with historical records. And I want to show you guys this because I think it, it, it's relevant in many ways. Uh, but what, what we're looking at here, where is my cursor? Here it is. Is a map, right? Wh which region of the world are we in? We're in the Middle East, if you don't recognize this. right? And we're going to go and have a look at where all this takes place. Why is my... There we go. So the color is kind of kind of messed up here, but let me get out of here. Why is the color not working out for me? All right. Well, the point is there's a lake here. It's I know it looks like a blur, but this is what we're looking at here is the Sea of Galilee, and Capernaum is this little town right along the water where this takes place, and uh, it turns out this is most of, uh, the location for most of Jesus' ministry is kind of his home base. And so let's keep reading. They went into Capernaum. They is referring to Jesus and his disciples. They went into this town, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue, so synagogue is, is the place of worship for the Jews there, immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, uh, that's basically a demon, so we're looking at a demon possession here, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Let me see if I can open up a better map here. Surrounding region of Galilee. Where am I? This may not work out. Galilee is the region to the west of the Sea of Galilee, so there's a the, the big region there. And so the first piece of Jesus' authority we're going to see in your handout here is Jesus' authority 
as a teacher. Jesus' authority as a teacher. How does Mark record, how does Mark describe his authority? Verse 22, he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Now the scribes, we got to understand uh, something about the ancient Near East in the first century. Most of you all probably can read. The exception be baby right there, my daughter cannot read. Uh, but most of us adults can read. But back in then, the literacy rate of the general population was, was pretty low. And so uh, you got that low literacy rate combined with, I mentioned, the availability of printed scriptures, it's not really available publicly to the general people until the printing press, right? 15th century, Johannes Gutenberg. And so most of the people had to rely on these religious leaders that we call scribes to read and interpret and teach the Jewish law. And these would be highly respected professions, right? You think about your, uh, your, your professors or uh, your, your pastors or your lawyers, depending on your view of lawyers. Uh, but Jesus is even more authoritative than these highly revered religious leaders. Now, what way is Jesus authoritative not as the scribes? He doesn't teach as the scribes. Most of these scribes, they derive their authority from previous teachers. So there, there's kind of an oral tradition handed down uh, from the rabbis. They're, they're deriving their authority from that tradition and from other teachers. But Jesus, he is self-authoritative. He teaches out of his own authority. We're going to see an example of that later. The second piece that we see in this passage is Jesus' authority over the supernatural. Jesus' authority over the supernatural. And so the unclean spirit is driven out here, right? Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him. Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, that's the demon, leaves, came out of him. So basically what we, what we read here is an exorcism. We're reading about an exorcism. Uh, Jesus is performing this exorcism. And interestingly, this demon, you notice in verse 24, the demon recognizes Jesus' authority. What does, he, what does the demon call Jesus? I know who you are, verse 24, the Holy One of God. The demon makes the same attribution of deity to Jesus that Mark does in that first verse. He says, Jesus is God. I know, I know you're God. I know you have God's authority. So this is Jesus' authority over the supernatural. All right, jump down to verse 39. It's not in your hand now, but um, look here in verse 39. So he's doing all this. He's doing the healing. He's doing the teaching. Verse 39, and he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And now flip over to the next chapter, Mark chapter 2. Look at these location details. Remember, we're reading a historical record here. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days. So he's out preaching throughout the region of Galilee. Now he's coming back to his home base, back in Capernaum. It was reported that he was at home, verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the doors. There's a big crowd there. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Right? We saw earlier, he, there's, Jesus' fame is spreading throughout Galilee. So, of course, you've got this huge crowd now gathering about. Uh, and then you have this group of friends, these four people carrying their paralyzed friend. They've got this creative way to cut the line, I guess, like get, get him in in front of Jesus through the roof. Let's keep reading. What, what does Jesus do? Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, son, excuse me, your sins are forgiven. Kind of interesting. He doesn't heal the paralytic right away pronounces forgiveness of sin first. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So we're seeing here, uh, Mark says it explicitly, Jesus has his authority to forgive sins. Jesus' authority to forgive sins. Now, verse 7, look at the scribes' response to all this. They say, who can forgive sins but God alone? Uh, They accuse him of blaspheming. That that means to slander God, right? Because they're saying only God has the authority to forgive sins. And now you have this person walking amongst us, drawing a crowd, saying that he's going to forgive sins, pronouncing forgiveness to these people, you saying you're God, Jesus? The answer is yes. Uh, and Jesus says yes. He, says he, he, he makes this claim of deity, not explicitly with words here, but what does he do is that he does this miracle. Right? He asks this question here in verse, uh, where is it? verse 9. He asks the scribes, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take up your bed, and walk? Which question is, which, which statement is easier to say? If I say to Craig here, Craig, your sins are forgiven, right? Well, did that really happen? I don't really know. Pretty easy to say. Pretty easy to say. Anyone can just say that. But if Craig is a lifelong paralytic, cannot walk, right? We're not talking about he's got a limp, right? We're talking about he cannot even walk. He's got to be on this stretcher. Everyone knows it. Craig, they've never seen Craig walk before. And I tell him, Craig, pick up your bed and walk. If he doesn't do that, I'm a fraud. Everyone knows I'm a fraud. So clearly the answer to Jesus' question is, well, it's it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because that cannot be authenticated. Uh, But verse 10, but that you may know, so what, what what is Jesus' purpose here? That you may know that the Son of Man, referring to himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Look at how he introduces this command. He says, I say to you. Self-authoritative. He says, I say to you, do this. So there's going to be here a visible miracle of healing the paralytic that authenticates the invisible work of forgiving sin. That's Jesus' authority to forgive sins, and then also Jesus' authority over sickness. He does the healing He does the miracle. And again, this I say to you introduction, this this pattern is is pretty common in the Gospels when when Jesus is speaking. He says, I say to you, do this or that. It occurs 15 times in the book of Mark alone and over 80 times in the Gospels, the four Gospels put together. He's not depending on anyone else for his authority. He, he, He is his own authority as God. And of course, what happens, verse 12 And he, that is the paralytic, rose, immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Look at at the nature of this healing, right? It's uh, instantaneous healing. It says immediately picked up his bed. This uh, This is so in contrast to some of the charlatans that we see today on the TV or you see various televangelists claiming they have the power to heal. Right? But this is, what, we're, what we're seeing here Jesus do is a complete healing, an instantaneous healing, and a publicly verifiable healing. Right? So it's instantaneous, it's complete. Right? These are publicly verifiable diseases and crippling conditions. Paralysis, earlier in chapter 1, Jesus heals uh, someone with leprosy. Do you ever know anyone with leprosy? I mean, he's healing these, these crazy, serious 
ailments, not your you know, vague headaches or you got, a, you got a back pain that's now gone after the televangelist proclaimed something on you. Right? That's not what we're talking about here. This is a true miraculous healing. Jesus has authority over sickness. All right, let's keep going. Flip over two chapters now to Mark chapter 4. More examples of Jesus' authority. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, at the bottom of your handout there. A familiar story to some of you, just Jesus calming the storm. Read from verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. What does he mean by that? He's referring to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they're, they're going to get in the boat and go east across the sea. There's a little body of water there. They're going to cross the sea. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, that's the back of the boat, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Verse 41, And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. All right, so what's going on here? They're going across the sea in the boat. There's some storm, right? And this is, this is not a small disturbance in the water. Mark records this is a great windstorm. And uh, we find out earlier in Mark chapter 1, there are at least four of Jesus' disciples that are fishermen by trade. They're named uh, in, in chapter 1. And so uh, the, these are professional fishermen. They're not going to be exaggerating a storm. Right? This, is, this is a serious storm. These are, these are professionals who now are afraid for their lives. How do we know they're afraid for their lives? They say to Jesus, right? Jesus, we're perishing. Don't you care? Right? These are professional fishermen that are now fearing for their lives because of the magnitude of this storm. Life-threatening. But we're seeing here that Jesus has authority over nature. Jesus' authority over nature. He calms the storm again just by speaking. There's no, there's no smoke machines. There's no yelling and screaming. He says, peace, be still. And it happens. This is authority. Interesting to note the disciples' response here. They were afraid for their lives previously. Now, verse 41, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this? It's probably a rhetorical question, right? They, they know who this is. They know who this is. They went to him, after all, when they were fearful for their lives. But now they fear because they recognize they are in the presence of God. They recognize this is, this is God's power. And so they, there was a fear that came upon them. So just Jesus' authority over nature. All right, let's keep going. One more chapter over to Mark chapter 5. Look at Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, so they're still on the Sea of Galilee here, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Now verse, skip down to verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the ruler's house, some who said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So daughter dies sometime in this period, right? Uh, they're saying, yeah, it's too late. Don't bother Jesus anymore. 
Verse 36, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus is here speaking Aramaic. It's a dialect of Hebrew, but thankfully, Mark gives us the translation. Little girl, I say to you, arise. There's that I say to you, author authoritative introduction again. Verse 42, and immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Here we're seeing Jesus' authority over death. Right? Not even just sickness, death. We, we, we witness a resurrection here, basically. Right? And again, this miracle of healing, of resurrection, happens instantaneously, completely. Right? In complete, instantaneous healing, the girl gets up, walks around as if everything was normal. Maybe a little bit hungry, I guess. Um, and, uh, and so this is, this is done with, again, a word. Jesus' authoritative word and his authoritative power over death. Pause here for questions. We've got one more example to look at. All right. Turn backwards now. Go back to Mark chapter 1 where we started. I'm going to read about Jesus calling his disciples. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So there's two out of the four that we know about. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they, le they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, they're a different fishing spot now, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boats, mending the nets, two more fishermen. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Here we're seeing an example of Jesus' authority over people. Over people. Jesus' over, Jesus authority over people. Now the point of the passage is, is not that you should leave your family or, or your spouse or your job. That's not the point Jesus is making here. But Jesus is calling these disciples into a lifetime of service to him. And the disciples, they respond. They respond by yielding to Jesus' authority over them. Right? They, they get up and leave. That's what, that's what the text says. Immediately they left their nets. They left their father Zebedee in the boat and followed him. And so we're going to be reading through Mark the next few weeks. That'll be part of your homework. We're going to be going through uh, several more passages in the coming weeks. And we're going to see repeatedly there's this theme of two sets of people as Jesus is interacting with the crowds, right? The first set, people who yield to Jesus' authority, like these four fishermen here. Second set of people being those who reject Jesus', Jesus authority for one reason or another. And it is the same today, even in our world. There are those who reject Jesus, many of them who reject Jesus, uh, but some who recognize that Jesus is God. Some, some form of rejection of Jesus in our day, um, some people say Jesus was, he was a good teacher, a good example for us to follow. Uh, we enjoy his teachings. Uh, n very few people these days will deny Jesus' historicity. That is, like, they, they won't argue with you if you say, 
Jesus was some person born slightly before AD 1, who walked on this earth and drew a bunch of crowds, did some stuff, taught some things. Right? They, will not, they will not argue with you usually about Jesus was being a historical person. But they said that that's all he was. He was just a teacher. He was just a person. They will not go as far as to say he is God. He, he does not have authority. What we saw here, we've seen here all these examples, right? Jesus has authority over, over nature, over sickness, over death. Uh, he has his authority because he is God. He's making these claims of being God through his miracles and through his teachings. There's a quote here on your handout by an author named C.S. Lewis. He says this, You must make a choice. Either this man Jesus was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being the great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So we took a little sampling of Mark here in the last hour. We saw, if you read these passages in Mark, that option that Jesus was a mere good human teacher, that option is not available to us. Jesus is God. So what is our summary here? Uh, kind of conclusion-wise, Jesus has great authority. There's nothing under creation that is not under Jesus' rule. Nothing, no animate objects, no inanimate objects, human, spiritual realm, earthly realm, all under Jesus' rule and his authority. Number two, he claims to be divine. We said he is God. He does this verbally as well as through miracles. And thirdly, uh, each one of us will have a response to make. Maybe you've already made it, but each one of us has a response to make. Do we acknowledge Jesus as God? We're going to see again, future classes, some people do, many people don't. That is what we're going to be reading about. Uh, flip back for, for a second, back to Mark chapter 5. We're going to go back for a second to the, the Jairus' daughter story. What does Jesus tell Jairus in verse 36? Mark chapter 5, verse 36. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear. Only believe. Believe what? What do I believe? First part, what we need to believe is that Jesus is God. We need to acknowledge that he is authoritative. He has authority over our lives. Uh, the last two classes, weeks five and week six, we will talk in more detail if you look at your class outline. What is a Christian repentance and faith? We will talk in more detail about what does it mean to believe. But the first piece, what are we believing? Jesus as God. All right, questions? Questions from what we've covered today? Questions from any of the passages that we read and looked at? James. Right, right. He says in verse 39, the child is not dead, but sleeping. Is there anyone sleeping here in this crowd right now? Um, no, they're dead. no, they're dead. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Uh, so the question here, is Jesus speaking figuratively or literally here? Right? Because you kind of look the same when you're, when you're lying there. Um, I don't know. Some people sleep more deadly than others. Uh, but uh, go ahead, Craig. You were...
that could be on his mind, and we, we know that is on his mind in verse 43, right? Um, he charged them that no one should know about this. So he does give that. But, so why does he say then, the child is not dead but sleeping? So is the dead asleep? Is the child dead or is, is the child asleep? Blair? I was thinking like, maybe it's that the child is asleep, but the Right. Yeah, I think that, that is certainly a part of it. Um, let's look at the internal evidence to see what exactly is going on. Is the child actually dead? Because this actually is, is a big question that people will ask. Uh, the internal evidence tells us that the child is actually dead, like dead, dead, uh, like no heartbeat kind of thing. Uh, why? Um, verse 35 is the first indication of this, right? Someone came from the ruler's house. Your daughter is dead. Now, the ru- it, it, it's pretty hard, I think, for, for, for most people to mistake being dead and alive. There were times when raising our kids, when they slept for so, so our kids didn't sleep well by the way, if you didn't know that. But they, there was, there, every once in a while, there was a day where they slept so long, Diane and I said to each other, they surely are dead. <laughs> but even then, we could go in, feel the pulse, and say, no, Angie's not dead. God merely wanted us to have a break today. <laughs> um, so so, so this one, at least one person made a determination, daughter's dead. Now notice here in verse 38, too, they came to the house, they have commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. In the ancient Near East, there is a common practice to hire, if you were of means, to hire professional mourners. This would be a way to honor the dead. You hire people to come in and make a big noise and cry over your dead daughter. Again, cultural barriers we've got to overcome. Um, So is is it likely that these professional mourners who are always around death, would mistake someone sleeping for dead? Probably not. Probably not. And, uh, and thirdly, right, why would, look, look at verse 42. The, the girl gets up, begins walking, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Why are they amazed? Because they know they saw a dead person now come to life. They would not be amazed if a 12-year-old girl wakes up from her nap and starts walking around. So then why? Okay, so, so we think, you know, most likely, Jesus is speaking figuratively in some sense. The child's not dead, but sleeping. What does he mean by that? I, I think kind of what Blair's talking about, this is, this is the way Jesus wants this crowd to see the daughter, that uh, he's going to perform this resurrection, and she's going to be as if sleeping, no longer dead. In the New Testament, uh, dead, being, being asleep is sometimes a euphemism for being dead. So Jesus may be doing a little bit of player on words there. Um, but somehow Jesus, in verse 39, the child is not dead but sleeping. He's speaking figuratively. The child is dead. He raised her to life. Go ahead, Webb. Right. Right. Uh, Paul does this elsewhere, right? And he says... Those of us who are asleep will be, will, be, will be awakened, right? He's referring to the Christians who have died. He refers to them as being uh, asleep. Good question, James. What are other questions from, from the passages here? All right, so for next week, uh, we do have homework. I hope you will participate in doing the homework, uh, is reading. Uh, not next week, rather. Next week will be outdoors, uh, outdoor service, so there won't be class next week. But on the 25th will be our next class here. Homework is to read Mark chapters 1 through 5, and then also chapters 14 to 15, which cover the death of Jesus. That's going to be our topic for next week is, is Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, but read chapters 1 through 5, 14 and 15. Now, the book of Mark... We're not in a real evangelistic session here, so I will ask you a question. Anyone know how many chapters are in the book of Mark? 16, that's right. It takes you about one and a half hours to read the book of Mark in one sitting. It's not that long, right? If you read 16 chapters straight through, so this week's homework really should only take uh, well, half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of action, right? We saw a lot of this word immediately as we're reading. 
Uh, so I encourage you to read it in, in one sitting if you can, uh, these, these chapters, 1 through 5 and 14 and 15. Uh, it is a historical narrative after all, so it's nice to kind of see that historical flow of events. Encourage you to write down questions or any difficult to understand passages, uh, and if any of those come up, we can discuss next week as well. All right, any other final questions here? Web. Yeah. The question is, how do we contrast the kind of fear the disciples have during the storm and the fear they have uh, after Jesus calms the storm? Now, the Jews generally are not atheists, right? It, they, they, they had a long, rich history of knowing God, at least knowing about God, um, in our humanistic, atheistic culture, like if you see something that you know has to be God, does that strike fear in, in people's hearts? Maybe not, if they don't really have an understanding of God. But the Jews, no, no, no. They had a rich understanding of God. If you look back in Isaiah 6, right? Isaiah gets a, a vision of heaven and encounters God. He has the same reaction. He's struck with fear. Because why? You're, you're, you're a sinner, before a holy God, the magnitude of God's holiness and his, his infiniteness, his eternalness, his largeness, for folks who have an understanding of God, for folks who not, are not hardened atheists, the right response is to be struck with fear as you stand before God. Uh, because the God ha who is all-powerful, who can judge, who is all-righteous, and who knows our hearts, um, and, and, and they're, they're in fear. And so that, that would be, of course, be a different fear than you're afraid you're going to get killed by the storm. That's a fear that anybody can understand, right? Uh, very few people are, are fearless in, in the face of death. Um, but that's more of a, a kind of a, a self-oriented fear, right? That's how I would contrast them, right? Uh, you're fearing you're going to get killed by the storm versus you're fearing being in the presence of someone who is not like anyone else. This Jesus person, he is God. He is unique. He created the universe, right? And these, these Jews, they, they had enough of an understanding of God and who he was that they rightly feared. Does, does that answer your question? Does it help? Thanks, Webb. What else? Mm-hmm. That's one aspect of it. Um, that's the aspect that we're focusing on uh, over the last hour. Uh, if you're asking, what is Jesus specifically asking Jairus to believe? Uh, we're going we're gonna to see this a little bit in, in uh, I believe, week five or six. Um, but uh, it's going to be all, all of Jesus, all of who Jesus is, all of what he teaches and what he brings. He's calling Jairus to, and I'm giving you the spoilers now, he's giving you the, uh, he's, he's asking Jesus to put all his faith in Jesus, right? Because when you're at the lowest of lows, your daughter is dead. You have daughters, I've got daughters. Try to put yourself in Jairus' shoes, right? What else can you cling to other than Jesus. Uh, there's going to be a key to understanding this passage here in chapter 5. You'll notice I skipped verses 24 through 30, 34. There's a second story that's sandwiched in between this episode with Jairus about the, uh, there's a woman who's, who's been bleeding for 12 years. Again, giving you the spoilers, the, the key that links these two passages together, like why, do, why does Mark does do this? This is a literary technique called intercollution or uh, the Mark and Sandwich. He does this frequently. If you read Mark, you'll notice it. You'll have story A and then story B, and then he'll go back to story A. We call it the Mark and Sandwich. Some people call it that. <laughs> There's always a key that links these two stories together. In this case, it's faith. 
faith in Jesus. So if you want a better picture of what Jesus is calling for, the kind of faith Jesus is calling for, read that story in the middle. Read the uh, patty part of that sandwich, the, this, uh, this woman faith. Um, read that passage. What kind of faith is Jesus calling for? Uh, read that passage, and I will leave that as an exercise to the reader. Come talk to me afterwards. All right, uh, you got a question, Dan? Comment? I just, as we look at this situation with Jairus, and the evidence for what she really did or not, and even uh, John's question there, uh, he came believing already the first time in those verses that he could heal. And so Jesus is continuing that, how much more he can do than that. All right. And the purpose of the gospel is this is the meaning of the gospel of the Son of God, establishing that he is the Son of God. So these things are recorded for the purpose not just to show that he's just a little bit of a good healer, but to really show that he is the Son of God. And a lot of these signs and miracles are done in the context, again, not of everyone knowing, but his disciples. If you notice there that he only took um, James and John, and uh, they have this, those Christian Peter there. Yeah. And so a lot of it is to testify to them who will be his witnesses as to who he really is. So the context of what's going on in the gospel also gives evidence to understand that this isn't just some minor thing. Uh, that's the whole purpose of recording them to start with. Right. Yeah, why, why does Jesus kick out all the crowds, right? He says, everyone, leave. Where is that, right? Like um, 37. 37. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. I mean... Because look, look. So we're already seeing a little bit of the kind of two groups here. Uh, Dan correctly points out, right? Uh, Jairus, he already evidences. He's already demonstrating some kind of faith because he comes to Jesus initially. But contrast that. Look at look at the response of those professional mourners. Verse forty, and they laughed at him. They did not have faith. He put them all outside and took the father and mother, etc. They did not recognize. Jesus was God. He just laughed at him. Other other questions, comments? All right. So normally, again, we're running this course uh, in a group that's uh, would be composed of uh, non-Christians, right? So we typically wouldn't open or close in prayer. Um, and this, of course, as you meet with people and read the scriptures with people, that'd be something that you can judge for yourself what is appropriate as you're meeting with non-Christians. Uh, but today, uh, as part of our Sunday school, let's, let's go ahead and close and, and give thanks to God for the opportunity to study. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for communicating your truths to us through your scriptures and for preserving it through the ages that each one of us, we have copies of it in front of us that we can read with our own two eyes about the glorious things that you have done. We thank you for the opportunity to learn from your word. Help us to respond in worship as we recognize Christ's authority over our lives. Even as we walk through this uh, evangelism curriculum, let us not merely build up knowledge, but let us be active in loving others, uh, using that knowledge to introduce those around us to Jesus, ultimately for your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen.